It was the most powerful political idea in history. A new faith for a skeptical age. It promised a world of harmony and abundance. If only property were shared by all and distributed equally. The idea was called socialism and it spread farther and faster than any religion in history. Then, in almost the blink of an eye, it all collapsed. What happened? In this series, we trace the rise and fall of an idea that changed the world, an idea that promised a heaven right here on Earth. century brought with it a faith in limitless human progress. Old beliefs rooted in religion and superstition were abandoned in favor of new ones supposedly based on science and rational thought. One of these new ideas was called socialism. Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. Welcome to Heaven on Earth, a think tank special. In this hour, a British reformer creates a model utopia on the American frontier. Soon, two German philosophers recast the idea as prophecy, arguing that socialism is the world's destiny. And as the 20th century begins, a Russian revolutionary sets out to fulfill the prophecy at any cost, including mass murder while peaceful reformers across Europe and North America respond very differently to socialism's call. And so we begin in America. The United States is not yet 50 years old. Land in the West is plentiful, a magnet to new settlers and to new ideas. Indiana, 1825. A great experiment was unfolding on the banks of the Wabash River. It was called New Harmony, and it would be a community of equality, heralding a new way of life, and eventually a new kind of world. Its founder was a British industrialist named Robert Owen, and his followers would soon coin a name for his vision. Socialism. When Robert Owen arrived in America, he was already famous for his progressive ideas. His cotton mill in New Lanark, Scotland, was the most heralded industrial enterprise of its day. He shortened working hours, restricted child labor, and even provided sick pay. And Owen not only cared about how his 2,000 employees worked, he cared about how they lived. Anyone who would live um, in his properties there at New Lanark had to live by his rules, and they were very specific. Um, how often they had to put out their trash, how often they had to bathe, when people needed to be home at night, the fact that they couldn't be publicly drunk, they had to spend time with their families, those kinds of things. Education was a key part of Owen's reforms. Rather than putting his employees' children to work in the factory, he put them in school. He also created the first preschool in the United Kingdom. It was part of what he called the Institute for the Formation of Character. Owen was developing a theory of human nature that would remain one of the fundamental ideas of socialism. It would resurface again and again. He felt you could actually mold human character. And he, in fact, said it is, of all truths, the most important that man's character is 
made for, not by himself. So he's an environmental determinist, and he believes that if you can begin virtually at birth and have this child in a superior environment, then you will, through education and liberation of this person's intellect and spirit, you will actually produce a perfect character. He called this the second coming of the truth. Um, I think he really did believe he was the second messiah, that he had come unlike Jesus, who could only tell the truth in parables. Owen, on the other hand, could actually say the literal truth because he had the science. People took Owen seriously. When he arrived in America in 1825, a joint session of Congress was convened to hear his ideas. Before an audience that included President James Monroe and President-elect John Quincy Adams, Owen announced he had purchased an entire village in Indiana. There, he would further the work begun at New Lanark. But this time, his community would be one of true equality. Harmony, Indiana was founded a decade earlier as a different kind of commune a religious one. Owen bought it from George Rapp, the charismatic leader of a sect of German Lutherans who were pulling up stakes to follow one of Rapp's visions. They left behind 160 buildings and some 30,000 acres of fertile land. If you think of, of Indiana at that time period, uh, it was the wilderness. And here in the middle of the wilderness, you had this beautiful town of brick and clapboard houses, a magnificent cruciform church in the middle of town in the commons. It was very sophisticated. It was called the Athens of the West at that time. On April 27, 1825, Robert Owen welcomed 800 eager arrivals to the town he had rechristened New Harmony. One group in particular was attracted to New Harmony, intellectuals. The village soon became a center of progressive thought and experiment. You had um, education at all levels, from infant to adult education. You had a newspaper being published. You had natural scientists out exploring the environs of New Harmony and beyond, creating natural science books to show people about the, the wonderful new species they're finding in the Midwest. You had people lecturing about equal rights for women. You had people lecturing about abolition. This was in 1827, 1828. To coincide with the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in July 1826, Owen issued what he saw as the next step in the liberation of humankind, the Declaration of Mental Independence. From here forward, he proclaimed, man was free from the trinity of evils responsible for all the world's misery and vice. Traditional religion, conventional marriage, and private property. The last of these was key. The quest to do away with private property would animate socialism for the next 150 years. I think that Robert Owen arrived slowly at the conclusion that it was individual property and individual profit that was, in a sense, undermining uh, the opportunities to create a new society. That inequalities uh, in society uh, were created by inequalities in the ownership of property and in the ownership of wealth and profit. Owen couldn't quite bring himself to turn over ownership of his property to the community, but people did get to live there for free. All goods were distributed at the village store. It was not the most efficient system. One New Harmony member named Paul Brown wrote that even salads were deposited in the store to be handed out. 
making 10,000 unnecessary steps and causing them to come to the tables in a wilted, deadened state. Before long, many members were losing their enthusiasm for the experiment. In the end, I think one of the problems in New Harmony was that um, it was a big group of idealists in one place, uh, in a very isolated place. Uh, they spent a lot of time thinking about the ideal of the perfect community. Ultimately, you had a lot of thinkers and not enough doers. The work simply didn't get done. Before long, industries that had thrived under George Rapp's followers were either sputtering or out of business altogether. After two years, several reorganizations and seven different constitutions, Owen's great experiment collapsed. Owen had a very hard time acknowledging that there was a failure at, at New Harmony. And uh, through a period of many months when everyone around him, including his sons, was saying, things are falling apart, Owen was saying, things are going great here. But eventually, he couldn't keep up that uh, pretense any longer because uh, everyone was leaving. And so Owen found a kind of alibi, I think, in blaming the people who came to New Harmony as being poor human material for his experiment. Owen's son, Robert Dale, stayed at New Harmony after its collapse. He had a different assessment of his father's experiment. He wrote, All cooperative schemes which provide equal remuneration to the skilled and industrious and the ignorant and idle must work their own downfall. For by this unjust plan, they must of necessity eliminate the valuable members and retain only the improvident, unskilled, and vicious. Despite the failure of New Harmony and other early attempts to put socialism into practice, the idea continued to generate great excitement. Soon, two philosophers would take utopian hope and turn it into faith by arguing that socialism was not only desirable, it was inevitable. Back in England, Robert Owen and his followers were building gathering places for the socialist faithful. They called them Halls of Science. Each week, thousands of adherents of Owen's new moral world flocked there seeking inspiration. Even though they proclaimed earnestly that they were had contempt for all religion, every Sunday they would all gather and bring their families there, but they didn't call them services, they called them meetings, and then someone would get up in the front and uh, do something that sounded like a sermon, but they called it a lecture, and then they would all sing from a special a book of uh, socialist hymns, except they wouldn't sing about uh, God and goodness, they would sing about uh, equality and brotherhood. In 1843, the Manchester congregation included a 22-year-old German journalist and radical named Friedrich Engels. For a young man rebelling against the faith of his parents, the services held a great appeal. Engels was a bit of a rebel. I think uh, he was the uh, typical uh, frat boy in many ways. Uh, he was very interested in uh, the military. He was interested in sports. Uh, he loved pubs. He loved women. Uh, but he was also an intellectual. He was, uh, in many ways, the kind of person uh, you would immediately recognize uh, as a leader and as somebody people would congregate around. Back in Germany, Engels had fallen in with a radical crowd. 
and his father was desperate to get him away from the bad influence of his friends. Well, his father gets this idea that uh, he should send Fred off to England, to Manchester, where the family business had a branch, and much to his relief, Fred agrees. Little does Dad know that Fred and his radical associates have come to the conclusion that the revolution is going to break out in England, and Fred is desperate to be there to be part of the action. Once in Manchester, Engels threw himself into writing what would become a famous study of the English working class during the Industrial Revolution. It was a very grim picture. I mean, workers in the 1840s in England, they lived miserable lives. They lived in squalid conditions. They worked 16, 18 hours a day. Child labor, female labor was incredibly common. Disease was rampant. The, um, the living standards were just below probably what we would even expect in many underdeveloped countries today. It was a miserable, miserable time. Engels saw that the working class was miserable, and at the same time, he was also envisioning a sort of salvation of the working class in terms of history providing a fertile ground for revolution. He understood that the workers, sooner or later, would understand that history was working in their favor, and therefore it, history would radicalize them. And by being radicalized, workers would no longer passively see themselves as victims of capitalism, but would actively seek to change it. Engels was soon contributing to Owen's New Moral World and other radical publications. Among them was a newspaper edited by a man who had once been part of young Fred's circle of college radicals back in Germany, the 25-year-old Karl Marx. Marx, starting very young, was very charismatic. He had uh, this uh, forbidding style and this great genius for theoretics, where... Uh, other people saw a meaning, Marx could see a meaning within a meaning, behind a meaning, and then a bigger meaning. And uh, his uh, colleagues would just look at him awestruck and say, this is our great genius who can figure it all out. Marx had little use for the ideas of his colleagues. But one of Engels' articles caught his eye. The two men began corresponding and in the summer of 1844, they arranged to meet in Paris. It was the beginning of one of the most intellectually fruitful partnerships in history. Marx was the prophet. His personality and his nature made him a flamboyant and charismatic figure, and Engels was very willing to defer to that. But Engels' early work and early research really provides much of the foundation upon which Marxism is later built. And Engels, of course, also supports Marx, not only through his research, but financially and psychologically. And so without Engels, in any number of ways, Marxism would never have come to be. In January 1848, students and workers took to the streets of Palermo. By February, the revolt had spread to Paris. Soon, nearly 50 uprisings engulfed the European continent from Russia to the English Channel. Marx and Engels rushed home to Germany to join the barricades. They had just finished writing a platform for a workers' organization based in London. The pamphlet would become known as the Communist Manifesto. The manifesto's timing would forever link it to revolution, adding to its mystique. Soon the world would learn the central premise of Marxism, that the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. For Marx and Engels, the heart of the system of capitalism was exploitation. As they saw it, the workers were the ones who were creating the things that were coming out of the factories, but the capitalists were the ones who were keeping most of the profits. What they talked about was the means of production, the Marxist term for the machinery, the factories, and this was terribly unjust, and the only way to rectify it was for the workers to get together and take the factories away from the capitalists so that they could have the complete benefit of the products that they themselves were creating. The Communist Manifesto predicted that as capitalism progressed, 
the working class would become so large and so poor that revolution would be inevitable. The result, socialism, a new workers' state where people contributed according to their ability and received according to their need. In time, government itself would become unnecessary and give way to a new stateless society Marx and Engels called communism. What Marx and Engels said was, don't worry, whatever happens to you, no matter how miserable your lives are, no matter how desperate your political struggle seems, history is working its way towards this outcome. And that's what gives Marxism its incredible force. Many socialists bought the argument. The Communist Manifesto would go on to become one of the most influential pamphlets ever published, with translations in every major European language by the turn of the century. But the manifesto was just a summary. Marx soon set to work on a volume that would lay out a comprehensive theory of socialism. In 1851, Marx wrote to Engels that he hoped to finish it in five weeks. But five weeks grew into five years, and then another, and another five. All the while, Marx depended almost entirely on Engels for financial support. The one time Marx went out and got an actual job was as a correspondent for the New York Tribune newspaper. Uh, but uh, he didn't speak English, and so he couldn't write the articles himself. Engels did speak English, and he got Engels to ghostwrite the articles for a number of years until he got his own English up to a level where he could write some himself. It took Marx nearly 20 years to finish his masterwork. In 1867, the first volume of Das Kapital was finally complete, with more volumes promised. The book would soon be hailed as a breakthrough in political and economic thought. In the scientific tenor of the time, after all, we have to understand that we're talking about the 19th century here, uh, Marx had accomplished, at least in the mind of many socialists, what Darwin had accomplished for biology. He had laid bare the development of economic laws that were at work in capitalism. And in that sense, he had revealed the motor of history, economic development. And it is to Marx still that we owe this kind of economic view of history as seeing people as sort of players in a drama in which economic forces are primary, and classes more than individuals as the kind of motor force of history. Engel survived Marx by 12 years. Thanks in large part to his public relations work, Marxism spread to workers' movements in Germany and across Europe. But by the time Engels died in 1895, many of the more perceptive socialists were beginning to notice a crack in Marxist doctrine. By the end of the 19th century, Marxist theory has been around for about 50 years. But it's not coming true. The workers are not getting poorer, and they're not becoming revolutionary. And at that point, there's sort of a choice. Uh, you can say, well, I'm for the workers and never mind the revolution, but we'll try to make things a little better step at a time. Or you can say, I'm for the revolution, that's what's going to give us the glorious new society, and if the workers aren't going to make the revolution, why, we'll find someone else to make it. As the 19th century drew to a close, two very different men would step up to make the case for each of these options. It would rupture the movement in two. The rapid rise of socialism in Germany frightened the country's rulers. In 1878, Chancellor Otto von Bismarck outlawed all socialist activities driving many members of the Social Democratic Party into exile. Among them was a young bank clerk named Edward Bernstein, 
He soon became editor of the party's clandestine newspaper, first in Switzerland and then in London. When Bernstein goes to England, he becomes acquainted with Marx and Engels, and Marx and Engels become very enamored of him. And after Marx dies, Engels asks Bernstein if he will put together from Marx's notes um, a fourth volume of Capital. And when Engels dies, he also is asked to be one of the executors of Engels' will. So he was very closely tied to Marx and Engels and seen in the period after their death as one of the most important international socialists. But Bernstein lived in a very different era from that of his mentors. Standards of living were changing. Just not in the way Karl Marx had predicted. It wasn't long before Bernstein began to question his Marxist faith. I th think that he thought that capitalism was evolving uh, along the lines of becoming more and more inclusive of the working class. And uh, he had some empirical evidence that showed that the working class was not getting poorer, and it showed that therefore the Marxist vision somehow uh, something was wrong with it. Bernstein decided he had to face his doubts. I said to myself, he wrote, this cannot go on. It is idle to try to reconcile the irreconcilable. What is necessary is to become clear just where Marx is right and where he is wrong. Bernstein's critique became known as revisionism and it stirred up an urgent debate among socialists around the world. Bernstein said that what usually is understood to be the final goal of socialism is nothing to me. The movement is everything. That really caused consternation in the party because people thought that Bernstein had given up the great goal and the great goal of socialism as we know of course was the breakdown of capitalism and Bernstein was no longer interested in or did no longer believe in the breakdown of capitalism. And if that's the case, then Bernstein actually was no longer a Marxist socialist. And if that's the case, it's as though uh, the Pope uh, in Rome uh, was no longer a Catholic. Thousands of miles away, a 29-year-old Siberian exile was carefully following the debate. His eventual response to Bernstein's criticisms would forever change the face of socialism. His name, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, better known by his nom de guerre, Lenin. Lenin was, first of all, probably Russia's most uh, exuberant workaholic in a country that did not have a work, work ethic. He was enormously hardworking. He was enormously smart. He had supreme self-confidence and a belief that he really knew what was right for everybody, and particularly for the future of his country. When Vladimir was 17, his older brother Sasha was executed for plotting to assassinate Tsar Alexander III. It was the beginning of his own path to revolutionary action. After he got to the university, and he took part in a demonstration, which was not political. It was directed against some regulations of the university. When he was arrested, and it was discovered that he was the younger brother of the executed terrorist, he was expelled from the university. And he was a top student. Uh, so he had to spend several years in idleness. Vladimir was banished to his family's country estate. There, he began to explore the stacks of radical literature his executed brother had left behind. He read various Russian revolutionaries, read Karl Marx, and began to come to the conclusion that it was just as important as his brother had thought to create a new social system for Russia, uh, that revolutionaries had to learn to toughen themselves, to make themselves into heroes who were going to give their all to save Russia, something like his brother had done. Vladimir's revolutionary activity would land him in deeper trouble with the law. By the time he heard about Edward Bernstein's writings nearly a decade later, 
he was in exile yet again, this time in Siberia. His life now revolved around one goal, revolution. Lenin was an individual who was often in a state of rage. That was his personality. But he was infuriated by Bernstein. But unlike a lot of the others, Lenin, in effect, realized that Bernstein was right, that the workers were not becoming revolutionary. When Lenin returned from exile, his younger brother met him at the train station. Dmitry Ulyanov would later recall the first topic on his brother's lips, the need to refute Bernstein. Lenin soon laid out a radically different idea of what to do if the workers wouldn't make the revolution. He developed quite early on what I would call a politics based on the absence of trust. So if you can't then trust the workers to make a revolution, whom can you trust? And Lenin said the only people you can trust are full-time professional revolutionaries like himself who will make a revolution in the name of the people. Lenin, in effect, said, heck with the workers, the revolution is everything. Except Lenin wasn't quite that honest. He didn't say, heck with the workers. He said, we'll have to discover the vanguard of the workers or of the proletariat, and that will be, well, me and my pals, and we'll make the revolution for the workers. For Lenin, this was more than just a theory. In 1900, he left for Europe to start an underground newspaper, Iskra, or Spark, to ignite a new revolutionary movement in Russia. In the summer of 1914, 50 years of peace in Europe came to a bloody end. Soon, the entire continent was mired in the fiercest conflict the world had yet seen. The Great War hit Russia particularly hard. There was a breakdown of transport. Uh, there was inflation. And in the northern cities, particularly the capital city of St. Petersburg, or Petrograd, as it was then called, there were great shortages of food and fuel. So the winter was very, very harsh. By early 1917, the ground was crumbling beneath the Tsarist regime. As Russian troops battled Germany in the West, strikes and protests spread across the country. Then, in Petrograd, a group of soldiers mutinied. It was the beginning of what became known as the February Revolution. To prevent a similar uprising on the front, the Tsar abdicated the throne. Power fell into the hands of a liberal provisional government. There was a kind of uh, chaos and anarchy that grew very quickly in Russia after the February Revolution, after the emperor had abdicated. Land was being seized by peasants. Villages were declaring their independence and sowing their own flags. And you have the idea that whatever the bonds, the glue that will hold a society together, fear, loyalty, tradition, it somehow melted away and evaporated, uh, with Russia crumbling into the smallest parts. Many Russian socialists welcomed the new liberal government, but not Lenin. He had lived in exile in Europe for most of the past 15 years, sometimes traveling in disguise. All the while, he had worked to strengthen and arm a new party in Russia the Bolsheviks, even ordering bank robberies and extortion to finance party activities. Now he saw the chance he had been waiting for. On October 25th, 1917, the Bolsheviks struck. This is a later Soviet reenactment of Lenin's men storming the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. In reality, the revolution was much less dramatic. The provisional government yielded with little bloodshed. Many didn't expect the new regime to hold on to power any longer than the provisional government had. When Lenin and the Bolsheviks seized power, they really were a tiny minority. 
Uh, and immediately, the Bolshevik regime found itself embroiled in a civil war, which it won militarily, but it also won because the Bolsheviks had been very successful in their use of propaganda to win what we might nowadays call the hearts and minds of the Russian people. Through posters, leaflets, and speeches, Lenin tried to convince Russians of just who were the enemies of the people and who were their saviors. But Lenin didn't stop with propaganda. The enemies of the people were marked for retribution, including priests, rich peasants, and political opponents. Lenin began with Nicholas II, the last czar to reign over Russia. Him, his wife, their five children, uh, the doctor, the servants were all massacred. And then their bodies were cut up and burned, and then what was remained was buried in a, in a, in a shaft, uh, which was only discovered a few years ago. Um, then, uh, in August of uh, 1918, a revolutionary who felt that Lenin had betrayed the revolution took uh, two shots at him and uh, wounded him almost fatally. Whereupon uh, Lenin and his henchmen agreed to carry out red terror. This was a terrible thing. The people were taken out of prison where they were put uh, political prisoners who had never been tried, had done nothing against the Bolsheviks, and were just summarily shot. And this, this shooting went on. Hundreds of people were shot at night. Many others found themselves banished to forced labor camps. Under Joseph Stalin, the system would become known as the Gulag. A part of the Red Terror was the gathering of all opposition members into concentration camps outside of major cities. And these were the very first camps, and it was from these camps that the entire Gulag system developed. So they are very much a precursor to what came later in Stalin's time. The Tsar had been reviled as a tyrant for executing a handful of violent radicals. Under Lenin and his followers, millions would die at the hands of the state. It's, it's difficult to calculate how many people came to die under Lenin's system and then Stalin's system because there were so many different ways to die. Um, there were people who died in camps, there were people who died because they were machine gunned down in the woods, there were people who died because they were deported, there were people who died in artificial famines. Um, when you begin to put the numbers together, you get numbers, statistics in the tens of millions. Lenin, uh, in general, had uh, no sympathy for human beings such as they were. He, he believed, as did others, that through education, legislation, you can, uh, you can make people not want to own things. You create new human beings. So the, the existing uh, human race was so rotten that uh, killing them was actually progressive. Amidst terror and war, Lenin was building a system of government unlike any seen before. Along with the old regime, Russia's capitalist industries, the banks, and the church were all completely destroyed. Replacing them all was a single institution, the party. Most of the Bolsheviks had no experience in business or administration, yet they drew up a plan to manage a country with the world's fifth largest economy and its third largest population. The results were a far cry from heaven on earth. By 1920, in some ways you can say that civil society and civilization had stopped. There was massive famine. The industry had broken down, the railroads stopped working, the economy had fallen apart and people were really reverting to the most primitive kind of bartering, massive loss of life. It was, it was a nightmare. By now, Russia was officially known as the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The Bolsheviks called themselves communists. 
That term had long been interchangeable with socialism, but it took on a very new meaning as Lenin broke all ties with the rest of the world's socialists and formed a new international movement. He had big plans for his revolution. Lenin said more than once that he never believed that the revolution can, could be confined to Russia. Uh, no, the revolution had to spread. It had to spread to the industrial countries of the West. First of all, Germany, Great Britain, ultimately the United States, and so on. In the Marxist scheme of things, the most advanced capitalist country was the one that was supposed to be transformed first, and that was the United States of America. Uh, but ironically, socialism never gained the popularity in America that it gained in almost all other countries, basically because its main constituency, or supposed constituency, the, the working class, the, the labor unions, uh, simply didn't accept it. They, they wrestled with it for a while and then rejected it. In America, the split between trade unions and socialists goes all the way back to the very beginnings of the organized labor movement in the late 19th century. Spurred by Marx and Engels, workers' movements across Europe were gaining strength. And most were embracing socialism as their guiding philosophy. In America, too, workers were organizing. But they would choose a very different path. Led by a straight-talking cigar maker named Samuel Gompers. The irony about Sam Gompers is that he was a Marxist who forged a, an anti-Marxist labor movement. Gompers was born in a poor family uh, in London and moved to the United States in his teens, uh, becomes a skilled cigar maker. Um, and all this time, he is a socialist. He's reading Marx, he's reading Engels, uh, he's reading other classics of, of European socialism. And he believes that the best way to um, organize workers to demand uh, their emancipation, uh, the best way to achieve socialism, is by making the trade unions themselves stronger. Gompers rejected the idea that workers needed radical intellectuals to help them achieve their goals. I saw that betterment for working men must come primarily through working men, he wrote. I saw the danger of entangling alliances with intellectuals who did not understand that to experiment with the labor movement was to experiment with human life. Gompers and his allies favored something called pure and simple unionism. It meant using strikes and boycotts to fight for better pay and benefits, rather than taking political action to create a whole new system. In 1886, Gompers helped found the American Federation of Labor, uniting individual unions across the country. As the AFL's first president, his salary would be less than he earned rolling cigars. Gomper's leadership of American workers would be challenged by socialists within and without the AFL. In 1901, some of these socialists came together to form the Socialist Party of America. At the party's helm was a rival labor leader, a railway man named Eugene V. Debs. Debs is a fascinating figure because he's one of these perennial candidates who runs for president five times uh, as a Socialist Party candidate. He achieves at most 6% of the vote, which he gets in 1912. Uh, but he's an enormously popular, charismatic figure, much more than Gompers uh, ever was. Originally, Gompers had hoped he and Debs would work together. But he ended up calling Debs the apostle of failure. Um, he was involved with the Western Labor Union, then the American Labor Union, then the IWW, and um, Gompers felt any attempt to organize a rival trade union was, in effect, doing the employer's job um, to weaken the union. You then had union fighting union. By 1903, 
the American Federation of Labor represented more than one and a half million union members and was becoming a force to be reckoned with in American life. At that year's AFL convention, Gompers forever parted ways with his old allies. I want to tell you socialists, he said, I have kept close watch upon your doctrines for 30 years, have been closely associated with many of you, and I want to say that I am entirely at variance with your philosophy. Economically, you are unsound, socially, you are wrong, industrially, you are an impossibility. Despite Gomper's opposition, the Socialist Party continued to gain strength. Surprisingly, the party drew more support from farmers than from industrial workers. One of the greatest centers of socialist support was Oklahoma. Eugene Debs won more than 16% of the presidential vote there in 1912. But America's entry to World War I brought a turning point for the party. In World War I, socialists in this country and around the world have to decide will they support their individual nations in the war or will they uh, support the International Socialist Brotherhood and oppose uh, the war of workers against other workers. And the American Socialist Party, unlike most of the European Socialist Parties, decides to oppose the U.S. government and to oppose World War I. And uh, most trade unionists, Gompers as their leader, uh, support the war. The more moderate socialists leave the party um, and actually work with Gompers in the AFL. Uh, the more radical socialists start speaking out against the war and they are arrested. Eugene Debs gets arrested in 1918, gets sentenced to 10 years in jail. Uh, and by the time he comes out of jail in 1921 when he's pardoned, the socialist party is pretty much a shell. The party would never regain its pre-war strength not even during the Great Depression. Gompers and the American Federation of Labor, later the AFL-CIO, had won out as the principal voice of America's workers. In many ways, Americanism proved to be a substitute for socialism for a lot of workers. After all, Americanism has always stood for uh, the, the average person being able to make it. The uh, American standard of living is something should that all Americans should be able to uh, enjoy. So the idea of class quality is something that undergirded the strength of socialism in Europe, but it's always been part of uh, the American vision uh, as well. So in many ways, Americanism trumped socialism and made socialism unnecessary as a vision for a lot of American workers. But socialism would yet find life in North America. As the Socialist Party faded from the U.S. political scene, some of the farmers who had embraced its ideals would take their politics north, to Canada. Today, Americans think of Canada as a more radical, a more socialist place. Well, the irony is that uh, Canada's first socialist politicians, Canada's first socialist intellectuals are Americans. And that is something that people today have forgotten. Uh, socialism, when it comes to Canada in an effective way, is an American import. Between 1898 and 1915, nearly a million people emigrated from America to Canada. Lured by cheap farmland, most settled in the western Canadian provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba the last North American frontier. They brought their knowledge of how to wrest a living from the soil and a set of political convictions rooted in their experience. Farmers in the prairie provinces of Canada and the northern Great Plains of the United States all faced similar problems in the early 20th century. They were all growing wheat. They felt that they were being gouged by the railroads, by the bankers. They felt that the market conditions were working against them. Rather than seeing this in terms of impersonal market forces, they personalized it and viewed bankers, railroad men, lawyers as the, as the enemy. 
Uh, the way you express your protest at the turn of the century is, hey, wait a minute, why don't we nationalize these things? And from that, uh, as the institutions resist, you move uh, fairly logically and pretty quickly towards radicalism. And they're radicalized in Canada in the same way, by the same people, in the same organizations as they are in the United States. But let me emphasize, these organizations start not in Canada, but in the United States. Every major U.S. farmers organization would resurface in Canada in some form. By the 1920s, these organizations and their successors began to make their voices heard throughout the prairie provinces. They were very soon able to influence electoral politics in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta simply by the power of their numbers. But it's really not until the Great Depression begins on the prairies, really in the 1920s, not the 1930s, with drought, with the collapse of the wheat market, that farmers began to contemplate forming their own independent political force. In 1932, a new political party emerged from a conference in Saskatchewan, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, the CCF. The CCF is a kind of big bang among radical groups. Uh, radical farmers, uh, socialist labor unions, and radicalized socialist intellectuals, many in universities, many also in the Protestant churches. Uh, and they get together and they write a platform that calls for the socialization essentially of the means of production and the means of finance. I mean, it's. It's, it is a classic socialist platform. The party would later moderate its platform to appeal to a broader base. In 1944, the CCF swept the provincial elections in Saskatchewan, becoming the first socialist government in North America and leaving a lasting imprint on Canadian politics. Well, the CCF stayed in power in Saskatchewan until 1964. And uh, one of its last acts was to bring in a socialized medicine scheme for the province of Saskatchewan, uh, which they imposed in the early 1960s and which had such tremendous appeal that it actually pushed Canadian politics in that direction later in the 1960s. Uh, the CCF's ideas were adopted by the governing Liberal Party of Canada, and the Liberals were the ones who finally brought in National Medicare uh, in, in Canada. Socialism found more of a following in Canada than in the United States. In 1961, the CCF became the new Democratic Party. It is still largely socialist in its convictions and still a force in Canadian politics. In America, some of the ideas championed by socialists also found their way into the mainstream. Ideas like unemployment insurance, social security, and the eight-hour workday. But socialism itself never took root. Be sure to join us for the second episode of Heaven on Earth, The Rise and Fall of Socialism. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. To learn more about Heaven on Earth, The Rise and Fall of Socialism, visit us online at pbs.org. You'll find complete interviews and more about the people and events that shape socialism around the world. Next time on Heaven on Earth. From China to Britain to Israel to Africa, a new generation of leaders brings to life radically diverse visions as socialism comes to power around the globe. The complete three-hour program of Heaven on Earth is available on DVD or as a companion book. To order by mail, write to the address on your screen or call 202-530-2550.